I want to thank in advance the um, panelists who've come to join us for this conversation and for uh, all of you uh, for being in the room to um, see this preview uh, of the fruit of two years or more of labor uh, between uh, Asia Society and Rhodium um, to try to make a positive um, contribution. Um, as Wendy said in her introduction, um, it, is, it, it is very much China's construction. Um, Xi Jinping used it in 2013 when he unveiled the Chinese reform program called the 60 Decisions, and Deng Xiaoping had said it a generation earlier in 1992, that if China does not reform and open up, does not continue making progress in terms of transforming its economy, it would find itself in a silu yitiao, a dead end or a blind alley. Um, that that is as stark as it gets, um, that there are things that need to be done to further transform the way the Chinese economy works. If that succeeds, uh, we have a lot of, um, of good implications uh, to consider. If it doesn't, we all have a lot of challenges um, to deal with, China and the rest of the world um, as well. 2015, Premier Li, as Wendy mentioned, um, said quite clearly, China invites uh, foreigners who have a stake in China's success uh, to join in the process of evaluating uh, Beijing's success effort at implementing the broad reform program um, that's been put on the table. We think about the stakes uh, that are tied up with those reforms. On this chart, we have two bars in each color. And those bars, the first of the two is the year 2000. The second is the year 2015. And they show China as a share of global totals. The first yellow bars, Chinese people as a share of all population in the world, uh, around 20%, coming down just a little bit, uh, uh, 2000 to 2015. In orange, the next pair, gross domestic product, China's share of the world economy writ large, less than 4% of the world in 2000, and today uh, 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 around 14%, 15% of total global uh, activity. The bars in blue there for imports and exports show a, sh a similar tripling of China's global share uh, in trade flows. And that, of course, is the China story of the past decade and a half of our lives as policy washers here in Washington and elsewhere. We've lived through the China price, the China shock, the both tremendous value created for consumers around the world and dynamism, uh, but also the adjustment challenges that came about due to Chinese trade flows. Skip over to the other side, the far other side of the chart on the right, and those purple bars that haven't even sprouted up yet are portfolio flows, uh, flows of investment money out of China into global stocks and bonds, and from world portfolios of savings, our Fidelity and Wellington and Vanguard accounts, if you will, partly going into China to buy securities in that growing market uh, that will ret return a healthy uh, 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 dividend to us over time as investors. That shows that the China shocks have yet to come. Whether these end up, those purple bars end up being like trade, tripling, quadrupling in the years ahead or not, have so much to do with whether China is able to fulfill its own reform plans. In fact, reform is the wellspring of China's gross domestic product growth outlook um, for the years just ahead. These are a variety of different projections uh, of what China's GDP is likely um, to be like now to 2025. Um, this is always a speculative exercise. The less speculative one is the dotted line up at the top, which is the IMF's projection, um, a fairly conservative um, estimate, uh, just out to 2021, showing China being able to hold up between five and six, or even a bit over 6% GDP growth. The Economist Intelligence Unit is the other dotted yellow line, which assuming that there's reform, expects a very significant dip in GDP growth next year in 2018, followed by a recovery created by that reform and that short-term pain leading to longer-term uh, betterment. The three other longer-term lines are mine. They're, they belong to Rhodium Group, um, and they describe different scenarios if China really is able to get its reform work done. There's no reason why it can't continue to turn in very strong 5% uh, on average growth now to 2025. But without that reform, it's very hard to see a recovery in Chinese productivity growth rates, which would leave only the extensive investment being made by government-related entities in China today. 
which would mean by the end of the period, maybe a 3% GDP story, GDP growth story. The bottom line there is if even the investment starts to slow down because people are not confident investing without that related productivity that comes from reform. And there we have very dire projections of what the numbers would look like. So these reforms matter immensely. If China gets it right, it's gonna be a shock that we'll all have to deal with in terms of growth and competitiveness. If China doesn't get the reforms done, it's gonna be a shock as well, but it'll be more downside recessionary uh, shocks and consequences we'll have to deal with. There used to at least be something of a consensus, including here in Washington, that China was moving toward this reform package that can be found in Chinese planning and in Western assumptions and think tanks like this one and those across the street and next door going back decades now. The problem today is that the confidence that it's just a question of how long it will take, not a question of what the direction of reform is, that confidence is broken down, as we can all see. So essentially what we're trying to do here is provide an objective basis to rebuild confidence, that convergence toward a shared set of reform policies that we believe make for opportunities for us to work together, China, the United States, IMF, everyone else um, out here, um, that that consensus can be rebuilt. So I'm gonna show you four out of the 10 uh, reform gauges, if you will, that we've built into this dashboard that will launch uh, fully on November uh, 2nd. Um, the first is innovation policy. We don't think of innovation policy as traditionally being a big part of the American policy package, I have to say. But in China and many other uh, uh, emerging uh, nations, and some European as well, Germany, for example, it is considered a core part of central government responsibility to have a policy for innovation. When we gauge something like innovation policy reform status in China, we are not asking, do we, from an American perspective, like the way China is doing its innovation policy. What we're asking is, is there evidence from Chinese performance that China is becoming more innovative? That it is adjusting its economic mix of what it does so that it's not just making socks and underwear, but more and more of the output of the economy is in innovative sectors. That is what will correlate with strong Chinese GDP growth in the longer run. We may or may not like the policies being used to get there, but that's another question. Our question for today is, is there adjustment taking place we can observe that helps us see whether this one is being done? And indeed, that yellow line at the bottom, what it's showing you is total industrial value added, it's an economic concept that we define in the methodology to this study, value added for the made in China 2025 sectors, those which have been labeled as innovative by China, whether their share of value added is rising as a share of all industrial sector value added. Pretty flat until 18, 24 months ago, the past year and a half or two, that has really started to kick up. And we see a rapid growth in the share of the innovative sectors in China relative to all industrial activity in China. So much so that the first dotted line in red there is the equivalent US level of industrial value added for those industries. The green and blue are the European Union and Japan for comparison. So we can see, sort of put it in context. Well, okay, so we see the slope of where China is. How close or far is that to advanced economy levels? And what this is telling us is that actually China is pretty close to advanced economy levels right now. Um, we have to ask ourselves, as reflation of old steel and industrial prices in China has been achieved as part of China's stabilization package this year, that's actually going to push up the share for the not so innovative sector. So we may see this line start to flatten out and even come down a little bit in the quarters just ahead. But certainly we have a sense of how quickly China could move up into more advanced levels of innovation as a share of all activity taking place in that economy. Next, I wanna mention something from my friend Marcus and the IMF, close to their hearts. We need to know how is China doing at reforming its financial system at home? The financial system in China is the foundation 
of growth in so many ways over the past four decades. The ability of the state to help direct and shape where credit is going has been instrumental to building out the infrastructure that has paid such returns, such dividends to China's growth, for example. But it also has given rise to the debt levels um, that many people are concerned about today. To provide an acid test, a quick but fairly reliable picture of the state of financial system reform in China today, we're looking here at the efficiency of that system. The IMF would probably, if it could only have one metric, would look at a risk mitigation metric rather than an efficiency metric. But people in the finance sector are probably more likely to look for efficiency of financing if they can only have one chart. We went for the latter. So what this is showing us is very simple. How many renminbi must be invested in the capital stock of the country to create one renminbi of output growth, of productive output growth two quarters later? IMF's basic benchmark for international good news is three to four should be that ratio. China was in the vicinity of four to five seven years ago. Today is above seven. It's taking more and more and more capital investment just to get the same amount of valuable output being created by the economic system. That is not sustainable. That's a problem. Tiny bit of good news in the most recent data available that will go into this out, uh, this, uh, this uh, first um, quarterly update, uh, data which goes through the second quarter of 2017. We had the first downtick in this incremental capital output ratio in more than 12 quarters. That's a sign that something right actually does seem to be happening in the Chinese financial system. The People's Bank has been leaning in very hard to control liquidity growth to slow monetary uh, liquidity uh, growth in the system. And sure enough, it's showing up in our indicator here in a positive way. Uh, another topic of great interest to everyone, um, state-owned enterprise reform in China, or rationalization, if you think reform is too generous a term. Westerners often over-project onto China their own sense of what SOE reform should mean, what state enterprise reform should mean. The reality for Beijing is that the government really doesn't intend and has not promised to withdraw itself from all industries of the economy. In fact, in most economies, including the United States, there are at least a few sectors where the government retains a, a place for itself. There can be natural monopoly arguments. There could be public good arguments. We could be talking about utilities that private sector interests are just not likely to want to get excited about and step in and do without some government involvement. <clears throat> so we're not judging them across the whole spectrum of different industries. Instead, instead, we have separated out those industries which are defined as key strategic industries in China. Defense would be an obvious example. In blue, in green, the pillar industries where Beijing argues it still needs an industrial policy to help industry get to the point where it no longer needs government support. And then a set of industries we call normal in the red line down at the bottom here where nobody's ever made a case in China that there's anything special about that sector that requires government involvement. Retail, uh, consumer goods retail, uh, after all. Uh, hotels, entertainment, these kinds of things that don't really have much of a strategic purpose. And what we've done is using data from listed companies in China, firms that trade on China stock exchanges, we're looking at the share of total revenue among those firms that's still earned by state companies, by SOEs. We don't expect the, the SOE share of revenue to disappear in the key industries. In the normal industries, we do. We did see a step down a couple years ago when some SOE reform and mixed ownership, the mixed ownership plan was first introduced. But since then, we've really been going sideways. We haven't yet started to see a real rationalization of the SOE revenue uh, streams that we can identify. It's not everything that we need to talk about when we talk about state enterprises, but it is a pretty good asset test. And we should see these lines move once SOE policy reform does get into a higher gear, hopefully in the near future. Uh, finally, in terms of the preview I wanted to put on the table just for our discussion here, uh, I'll mention labor 
market reform and shared welfare. Um, Chinese development economists are some of the finest in the year in the world. I've had the honor to interact with many of them. And there are reasons to be both excited about income gains by Chinese workers over the years and also reasons to be quite concerned. The least politically empowered segment of China's labor force, of course, is the migrant workers uh, who don't have formal rights to reside in cities, get social services, make sure that they get their paychecks uh, from potentially abusive uh, employers, things like this. So what we've done here is we've honed in on wage growth for migrant workers, separate from the green and blue lines, which are, impl- which are workers and their wages at private and state-owned enterprises. And we look at them in comparison. A few years ago, all three of those groups had similarly good wage growth, and they were all above the dotted line. The dotted line is GDP growth at present, projected back. So if workers are doing better than GDP, then workers and labor are on the net winning side of the economy. If workers are seeing their wages grow slower than GDP, then they're not keeping up with the growth that somebody's enjoying in the system. We have lag in data for uh, most of the workers, but for the migrant workers, we actually have quarterly updated information that we can use to do this chart. And we see that over the past 12 months, actually their wage growth has fallen down below GDP growth quite significantly. It's only 70% of the rate of GDP growth today. That needs to be remedied to make sure China stays on track to breaking through the middle income ceiling and having enough labor to uh, fuel its rise into the future. Um, Last slide here. I'm at my zero mark right on time, I think. Um, I wanna just describe to you a little bit more what is in this dashboard um, that will be available for everybody to uh, use as a common framework for thinking about how China is doing in terms of its reform agenda. For each uh, section, and here we're looking again at labor, you'll start with this primary metric. The If you can only have one thing to look at, what should you be looking at? That primary chart up at the top left here. But there's also going to be a short text of a thousand words or thousand and a half words um, with some supplemental chart work that helps to uh, broaden out the discussion a little bit and helps the reader understand some of the other key metrics that are important for evaluating that issue. In the text, we'll have at top a very short assessment of are we moving in the right direction, standing still, or backsliding? Hopefully not too much for each one. We'll have a discussion and an interpretation of the metrics for the quarter. We are only looking at outcomes here. So even if there's great policy talk about reforming labor, that will not be in our metrics and we're not gonna give that any credit in our top level analysis. We will, however, have a policy discussion that points to the things that could be foreshadowing improvement in performance in the quarters ahead. That's the policy discussion. And finally, there's detailed methodological notes um, with each of these clusters to help the user understand the choices we had to make lots of hundreds and hundreds of hard choices, often in consultation with friends in China and economics, uh, friends at places like the fund here around town, um, and some of you here in this room as well. So that's what we're all about here. Um, At the end of the day, we will succeed if we've taken a conversation about working with China that today is more and more about fear and conjecture and anxieties, and instead bring it back to an objectively based conversation where we all can reference the same observable trends in how the economy is moving as a basis to decide what our long-term opportunities to work together look like. Um, Thanks for letting me share that introduction with you. And Wendy, I guess we'll move to the panel now. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Dan. Um, I think that gives a flavor to everyone of how detailed and how thorough this work is and how much thought has been given um, to each area. Dan has only previewed four of the 10 areas, so we hope you're really interested and now you're gonna be really excited um, until November 2nd for um, the official launch when you can look at all of um, these areas at the same time. And to emphasize, these will be updated on a quarterly basis. 
um, and they will be, it's really an online tool. We're not physically, you know, publishing reports. It will be up to the user, the policymaker, the business, the China watcher to go on our website and to track these reforms. Um, as you can see, we've got a great panel here to discuss not only the dashboard, but the state and the prospects for China economic reform. Um, there were bios on the table outside, and let me briefly introduce my colleagues on stage with me. First to my left is Dr. Marcus Rodlauer, who's the deputy director of the IMF's Asia and Pacific Department. He oversees the Funds China team, a position he's held since 2012. He's worked at the IMF in a variety of positions over the years, and earlier in his career worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Austria. Welcome. And to my right is Minister Zhu Hong. He's the Minister for Commercial Affairs at the Chinese Embassy in Washington. Um, he's a real trade guy, and the more I read your bio, the more impressed I am with your background. You've served at the WTO Mission for China, um, and you've also negotiated a number of FTAs for your government, um, and you joined MOFCOM, I believe, in 1983, when that wasn't its name, but right now it's called MOFCOM. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, um, I'm pleased to introduce a former colleague of mine. I had the honor of working with Erin Ennis um, when she was at the office of the U.S. Trade Representative in our Congressional Affairs Office and then working on Asian issues. Um, now she is the senior vice president of the U.S.-China Business Council, where she directs the council's government affairs and advocacy work for member companies. And she really brings the business perspective here today, which I think is very um, important. And of course, Dan is on the stage too, and I'm sure he will um, have a lot more to share on these topics. So um, I'll start, moderate, ask some questions, and then we'll turn it over to you all in the audience. So please start giving thought to what you would like to ask this panel. Um, let me start with my colleague to the left, Marcus. Um, at the start of his tenure, President Xi Jinping presented a comprehensive economic reform agenda for China. After four years, what is your assessment of, of the agenda? Um, in your view, where has the most notable progress been made? And which areas have fallen short of expectations? <clears throat> thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Dan, for inviting me. Um, Asia Society, I just learned a new acronym, ASP. Policy <laughs> Institute is, this rolls off your always tongue. <laughs> does great, great work, and that is a great initiative. Thanks also for, um, for, for putting this uh, panel together. When I sent out the, um, uh, the preview that you sent us to uh, my team, which is a tough bunch of fellows, I tell you, what I got back was unequivocally uh, great stuff. Very innovative, uh, quantitative, very useful. So thanks for doing this. We will certainly follow it very closely. And we kind of agree with most of what's in there. Uh, let me just maybe, uh, since you asked, um, you know, how do we see progress in China over the last uh, five years, uh, six years since Xi Jinping first put down his, his program. Um, let me answer the question in three, uh, at three levels. First, looking at the big, big picture of structural transformation in the economy, which is, you know, you, we've dealt with this at the IMF for, for 50 years, how to measure progress of a reform program. You can look at it from a, at a very, very aggregate output outcome level, you can look at it at sort of more proximate outcome levels of policies, which you think what you're doing. You can then look at it, uh, you know, in terms of actual policy implementation, what are the measures that have been taken. Uh, so, you know, in all these levels, um, it has its benefits and it has its drawbacks. So let me start by an overall view of the structural transformation. Then I will talk a little bit about policies and then I will mention one new thing, which really, I think, is, 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 is quite dramatic that's happening in China. Uh, structural transformation of the economy. I think we have four or five, three or four really big uh, areas of progress that one cannot just overemphasize. First, this huge transformation of the economy from an export-oriented 
external demand uh, rely on the economy to one that's based on domestic demand. The, the reduction in the current account surplus to now way below 2% of GDP from one that has been flooding the world with goods, to flooding the world with liquidity, flooding the world with 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 problems and importing uh, labor and, and 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 jobs into China, I think that really cannot again be overemphasized, and that this is is continuing. Second big, um, and it has continued under Xi Jinping. Second big change that we see the shift from industry to services again has continued. Now services now are over fifty two percent of GDP. That was forty five when Xi Jinping took over. And it was about 41, 42, just 10 years ago. In a large economy like China, to see that kind of structure change, 10 percentage points of services versus industry, is nothing short of dramatic. And likewise, we also see that you know, one of the core sort of original sins of what's the problem of China today, the huge amount of savings, the excess amount of savings, too little consumption, people not able to spend, not willing to spend because they fear they're not safe. Uh, that also has come down from 49 to 45% of GDP. Uh, and I think you know, these are really major structural changes that are happening under Xi Jinping also um, in the right direction. Now, three things that are not so great. Uh, and uh, the, the one that is foremost on our mind, of course, is the debt problem. The fact that public and private debt has risen from 180% of GDP at the start of Xi Jinping's uh, government to now uh, over close to 270% of GDP. 90% of Chinese GDP, which is $10 trillion plus of debt added into this economy over the last five years is a problem and is a mounting problem and is just beginning to be addressed. And so that is a, perhaps the biggest shortcoming under Xi Jinping's uh, uh, agenda uh, that we have seen and you know trends are still uh, going up second the footprint and profitability of soes really has increased in the sense the footprint and the profitability has weakened further in the five years since he took over now soes are um, you know the assets of over 200 percent of gdp that's up from about 125 percent of gdp at the beginning you know, prior to the asia crisis so this large footprint of the state-owned enterprise sector, this, um, this whole impetus that uh, really uh, the growth and development in China has to come from the state sector, seemingly, uh, is, is a, in our view, a, a shortcoming and a negative aspect. Linked to that is the overcapacity problem. In a lot of talk in recent years about addressing overcapacity, but when you actually look at the numbers in the coal sector, steel sector, non-ferrous metals, cement, f flat glass, and so on, you check the numbers of China's market share in global, in global markets in these industries, they're all around half and even more and have gone up. And the capacity utilization really in those, uh, in those areas has gone down. So not only have these overcapacity sectors over the last five, six years gone worse in terms of their profitability and the dead weight and that they're putting on the Chinese economy, but they're also exporting the problem to global markets in terms of excess capacity and price pressures and so forth. Uh, again, you know, maybe uh, uh, more talk than action in actually really addressing it on a net basis. Uh, and the third uh, point where things really have fallen short of expectations is the whole question of local government financing, fiscal management outside of the central government budget. You know, you look at the numbers, you are even more dramatic than ours. You put the total fiscal deficit, I think, around 16% of GDP. We see it at around 12 12% of GDP deficit of central government plus local governments and other uh, non-central government fiscal entities. They are constantly adding to debt and to inefficient investment. So, uh, you know, even though there was the budget uh, law of 2014 that was supposed to radically discipline this sector, in reality, uh, this has, has not really happened. In fact, we have seen the uh, non-central government deficits go up. And there's various good reasons for that, but I think that's certainly a problem. Uh, now, on policies, a few words. Uh, you know, and then that's maybe, you, you know this very well, looking purely at these kind of outcomes the way we do here, and sometimes in the IMF, fails to understand what's going underneath or what's beginning to happen possibly underneath. Look at it in the financial sector. 
the last three quarters have seen a dramatic shift in China in a real new focus on financial stability, tighter supervision, disciplining the shadow banking system. And we're beginning to see it sort of in the numbers of credit and of leverage and of corporate debt and so forth. It's sort of bending and you're seeing it bending down a little bit, but we really see in terms of the policies a a more dramatic shift than what the, the outcome numbers that we see here show. We hope it will continue. So here, really, it's very much a glass half full, half empty. And it depends on whether you, and that's one of the key issues that we'll see after the uh, Congress, uh, will, this, will this continue? Likewise, as I've mentioned on the local financing framework, even though in the numbers, the fiscal numbers and the quasi-fiscal numbers have not improved, have actually gotten worse. The policy framework that is being put in place by the budget law and through various other things, are laying the groundworks, if it's continued, that it could really, really improve. Third big improvement we have seen on exchange rate management and uh, the balance of payments. China almost was sliding into a balance of payments crisis two years ago. They have, I think, managed it quite well in terms of moving away from the dollar peg to a somewhat more flexible management of the exchange rate while disciplining uh, capital flight. And then I think also quite a lot of progress in areas that we don't really look at, but when I look at the HOKO policy, the one-child policy, the anti-pollution policies, green finance, there's a lot of very important policy steps that are underway that go in the right direction. Third one, I'm, I'm, I'm overstepping now my time, but I don't want to stop before mentioning the real big news for me over the last year is China's private sector especially in the high-tech industries and in the higher-value-added industries. I think what's happening in China over the past two, three years, you have alluded to that, the way how China is moving up the value-added chain uh, in industry, in services, the way how this combination of a huge domestic market, very enthusiastic consumers and investors, uh, a good ecosystem both in terms of physical infrastructure but also in terms of government policy and a very supportive government, how this is creating a cocktail that is really quite explosive in a positive way uh, for China to move very rapidly up the value-added chain and create and really set the stage for high-tech G- China digital globally of what is happening in this key, key sector, which will in the end, I think, as you said, uh, dominate and, and decide how China can increase, increase productivity and, and grow uh, into the medium term. So overall, I'm actually quite, quite optimistic. Uh, you know, when I see where the glasses are half full, half empty, where the government is moving, the results that have been achieved, the underbelly of the economy, this huge private sector that is vibrant and vibrant, um, I'm cautiously optimistic that all of this is going in the right direction. Good. Um, thank you very much. You put a lot on the table for further discussion. Um, Minister Zhu, maybe I can turn to you. Um, when you look at um, the reform pledges that were announced four or five years ago now, how would you assess the progress? And are the, are, do you want to respond to any of the points that Marcus made with respect to areas where we've seen a lot of success and progress and promising policies? but also some of the challenges that he he mentioned as well. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, 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 panel discussion. And I would also like to thank uh, Daniel for your introduction and thanks for your your hard work in in research. And uh, 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 I'm very happy to be here to share with my views on the China's uh, reform programs. Uh, Four years ago, uh, uh, China has uh, uh, started uh, 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 new reform programs uh, under the leadership of uh, President Xi Jinping after the third plenary session of the uh, 18th uh, Party Congress. And uh, uh, from that on, uh, the uh, central government uh, uh, take a very uh, strategic role, uh, play a very strategic role in uh, guiding the the whole China's uh, uh, reform program. Uh, I think the first one is uh, so-called the the, uh, super uh, design, super design. 
uh, the, the central government established the so-called the um, central leading team for comprehensive deepening reform uh, at the at the central government level, and at each of those corresponding uh, government level, all the uh, number one guy in each of those uh, province or cities, they are guiding the uh, task of reform. That is uh, the advantage of China's uh, leadership systems. Uh, so uh, in those four years, uh, the uh, 20, uh, 38 uh, meetings was held. Uh, by President Xi Jinping and uh, issue uh, 239 policies in those meetings and uh, review 30 policy uh, in those meetings. More than 1,500 1, reform measures have already been implemented in the field of SOE, fiscal and taxation, financial institution, rural land arrangement, uh, and so on and so forth, developing, an, uh, developing a new open economic system, education, healthcare, judiciary, and ecological civilization. Many of those uh, long due uh, problems were resolved, and uh, uh, we can say that uh, expected progress was made. Uh, uh, now we, uh, uh, we can review the past uh, uh, four years' uh, 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 reform. Uh, we think the, the one uh, prominent uh, feature is to extend the economic reform to uh, a broader areas, uh, which is include uh, the uh, cultural and uh, social mechanism, ecological civilization, democracy and the rules of law, and also the CPC, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, own uh, uh, construction, uh, 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 system uh, construction. Uh, we, uh, I can say, see that uh, uh, six uh, characteristic is uh, uh, in this uh, current reform. The first one is uh, focusing upon tough and very difficult issues, very difficult tasks. The second one is emphasizing upon people's livelihood, take care of the people's concern. The third one is uh, uh, the tightening uh, the CPT's uh, internal management, uh, which is uh, quite impressive to, to both in China and uh, in abroad. And uh, uh, the fourth one is promoting fair and uh, just uh, judiciary uh, systems. Uh, we we strand, uh, we correct some uh, wrong wrongdoings in the past. Many famous uh, cases in, in that area. And the fifth one is uh, the uh, establishing lifelong accountability in environmental protection. We we attach great importance on on the uh, environmental protection in this, uh, in this round of uh, reform. And uh, uh, finally, it's uh, regulating effectively uh, the duty modeling at the various government levels, which is uh, quite uh, impressive to, to the outside world. We punish so many, so many uh, government officials at the central level, at the provincial level, at the local level, and at the grassroots level. Uh, for the uh, effectiveness of this uh, 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 reform, I would like to uh, take some uh, uh, example. The first one is uh, the after the financial crisis, China is still the uh, momentum the, for the global uh, 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 growth, uh, as mentioned uh, by, uh, by Mr. Uh, by Mr. Uh, Rod, Rod Lauer. And uh, uh, in 1916, uh, China's GDP is 6.7%, uh, uh, and our, uh, uh, the total volume is uh, 1.8 trillion. Uh, the, uh, our 
uh, increase uh, uh, contribution to the world economy is uh, more than uh, 30%. And uh, I think in the first half year, we can see also a very healthy uh, development in uh, this year. The first, uh, it's uh, around uh, nine, nine point, uh, 6.9% for GDP growth. And uh, we, can, uh, we can see that uh, realize the whole year is around uh, 65 is not a very uh, tough uh, uh, task. Secondly, uh, uh, after a uh, financial uh, crisis, uh, China's import increased uh, uh, by 58.1% uh, 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 billion U.S. dollars. Uh, it accounts uh, the 20% of the total, total uh, 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 value added. Uh, uh, it could be, uh, it become the uh, uh, global the, the major contribution to the global trade. And thirdly, uh, it's, uh, uh, this round of uh, reform, uh, the purpose is to, uh, to support the, uh, to push the uh, Chinese, uh, 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 the momentum of the uh, uh, growth from those low cost input into those innovation driving and uh, keep the uh, ec economy at a, at a, a middle and a high speed. Uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Rosen uh, introduced, uh, uh, we, uh, the share of the innovative output in the in industrial value added, uh, 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 value uh, addition is uh, advancing very continuously. Uh, I think uh, uh, we have laid out uh, uh, the uh, overall uh, uh, package for the uh, reform. Um, uh, the main uh, uh, challenge is to how to realize each of those uh, contents, each how, how to realize the goal. Uh, we think that the, the core issue is uh, to, to how to deal with uh, the uh, uh, relationship between the uh, government and the market. And uh, uh, the, uh, in the document, we, we mentioned that uh, we are going to, uh, uh, the uh, direction of the reform is to uh, make uh, the uh, uh, market uh, to, to be a decisive uh, uh, role. Uh, in, in, in resource uh, allocation. And uh, in the meantime, we also encourage uh, to, to have a, a more efficiency government to play, to let the government uh, to play um, a, a, a beneficial role. Uh, this is a, a, a very difficult balance. Uh, we also have some uh, uh, many uh, different uh, uh, evaluation, but uh, uh, I think uh, to how to play, uh, how to make the uh, market force into a decisive role, uh, it, there's a long way to go. We, we haven't finished that uh, task. And uh, of course, we, we also want to have a good government. Uh, well, maybe now, I, maybe it, I can stop you there and let me maybe turn to Aaron for a minute uh, and come back to you. Okay, I only have one last okay. sentence. Okay. Uh -huh. okay, of course. I, I think uh, 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 the most difficult issue, I personally think, is that uh, when we reform SOE and uh, uh, how, to, how to reform the uh, fiscal and the taxation system is, uh, is uh, something we remain to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank no. you. Thank you well, for thank your patience. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> That was a very um, useful summary, and yeah. we, you know, we appreciate it. Um, Aaron, maybe I can turn to you then, and I'm going to quote something from one of your reports uh -oh. because I know. So <laughs> get ready, <laughs> because I think it it expresses um, maybe not as much optimism as other people in the panel have expressed on the reform front. And this is what um, was said in one of your recent reports: that despite the number of reform policies released by Chinese government agencies since economic reforms began in 2013, many are still not broadly applicable across industry sectors or specific enough in an implementation detail 
to address foreign company issues and few reduce market access barriers for foreign companies and others do not clearly apply to foreign companies. So can you elaborate on this and maybe you can express you know, the views of the US business community, how you all see this reform process and where you've seen progress and where you really um, see that more progress needs to be made. Sure, let me give a little bit of context for the quote. Um, because I'm sure you all have been memorizing U.S. China Business Council's reports over the years. Um, we, for several years, tracked China's economic reforms solely through the lens of how foreign companies were being treated in those policies. So um, Dan does it much more eloquently and much more um, user-friendly than we did it. Ours was uh, 144 pages worth of text, which I'm sure you all read in detail, um, to evaluate how uh, we felt foreign companies were faring in the economic reforms. Um, The caveat to that, obviously, is that China isn't reforming its economy solely for the benefit of foreign companies. Um, But when you look at it through that lens, it's a mixed bag about um, how foreign companies have fared. There are definitely some improvements that have been made, and many of the ones that have already been noted. Um, Certainly, the changes to China's financial system have made it easier for companies in general to be able to move money across borders um, and to get financing. Um, China implemented a regulatory review at the state council level um, that requires each agency to review the policies that they have put out and whether they are working effectively and eliminate those that aren't. That, in principle, is a great policy, and that could be very effective since, as with any government, there's lots of policies that are on the books that probably aren't acting very effectively. Um, One of the notable things that came out of the initial economic reforms were the creation of a variety of free trade areas that allowed the testing of many of these policies to um, both in terms of how foreign and domestic companies could deal with it. So in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, for instance, the government created um, what we would refer to here as one-stop shopping for getting a business license, where all of the ministries that you might need to be able to be certified as a new business, um, could you could go to one spot and be able to get your business license. Um, that is great, and there w- it actually showed a lot of interest of Chinese companies using the, using the Shanghai Free Trade Zone in particular uh, to register businesses. That in itself shows that there was an untapped market for entrepreneurship in the market. At the same time, the free trade zones were created as a testing for those areas, and there have certainly been some successes in how those policies were implemented in the free trade zones. But the promise, um, or at least the idea behind it, was that those would be tested in the free trade zones and then taken nationwide. And in general, we haven't seen that happen. Um, So definitely some missed opportunities at a minimum. I would say more broadly, though, some of the areas where uh, where the economic reforms have fallen short in the in terms of foreign companies, um, while we've seen good progress generally in these sector specific reforms that Wendy mentioned, um, you know that's been in banking and insurance and in um, some of the regulation of labor. Uh, we haven't seen the kind of overall change that the economic reforms were seeking. We have not seen a significant change in approach to ensure that domestic and foreign companies are genuinely being treated on the same basis. And yet the central government has noted that is among the goals that are coming out of these, or that are set for these policies. SOE reform, I think, is an important part of that because where China has succeeded best in its economic development has been the areas where it's had genuine competition. Um, Manufacturing was largely open to foreign investment when China joined the World Trade Organization. And I think we can all agree that China is a global leader in manufacturing. But we haven't seen similar reforms in the services sector, and certainly even areas where we'd like to see more competition with state-owned enterprises, that's fallen short as well. We believe that those areas hold a great deal of promise for China's economy, and so they're areas where um, the story of economic reform, I think, um, remains unfinished. I think one of the final areas that I'll just note is that, um, you know, kind of underlying all of this is um, a monumental task to change a, a very large economy, one that was large even before it joined the World Trade Organization and grew to its current size, and many success stories that have come out of it. If any of these reforms were easy, 
China would have done it long before now, and they mm -hmm. wouldn't have had to have a massive policy on it. Mm -hmm. But I think the key here is that there's a lot of uncertainty about what happens next. Um, frequently here in Washington, at least, and maybe in other locations uh, as well, there's been some speculation about whether everything on economic reform was on hold this year in the lead up to the party congress. There's also the question about whether um, there really is as strong a commitment to these kind of economic reforms and, and how far the government is interested in going to genuinely level that playing field. So I would say it's a mixed bag. And from our perspective, with our 144 pages of text to look at it, um, some positives, some, some um, backtracking, a lot of neutral policies, but ones where I think it's not entirely clear exactly where the direction is going. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And Erin, I think you make an important clarification between the ASPE rhodium dashboard and the exercise that your organization is, is is taking. Ours, once again, we're looking at the reforms based on the pledges the Chinese government made. Yours is what looking at the reforms through the lens of what this, how this. Yes, um, ours is essentially the yeah. what have you done for me lately yeah. assessment. Okay. okay, I was going to be a little more diplomatic, <laughs> but you made that easier. Dan, I'm going to turn to you and ask you a question, but I'm sure that you'll probably want to respond to some of the points made. But I think one of the themes that everyone has raised is this the notion of, of, of policy announcements versus outcomes. And I know in designing this dashboard, that's been a real challenge, um, that we'll see a number of policies announced, they take time to implement, and then it also takes time to actually show up in the charts and the quantitative data. So perhaps you can share with us how you've, you've addressed this issue in the dashboard and maybe you can respond to some of the points that were made here that are near and dear to your heart. Thank you, Wendy. Um, and great comments across the board. And everyone really talked about how to judge the policy commitments being made. I uh, very much agree with uh, Marcus, for one, that there are some really impressive indications in the policy space right now that some good things are um, queued up to happen or maybe even already starting to happen. But the problem for the rest of the world, the dilemma here, is that a lot of, most of China's economic problems are unique situations. No major economy has tried to do all this at once before ever, really. It's a, it's a, a tribute to China's success that it has created a novel set of challenges where there's no guidebook to use. And so even if the policy package being discussed is perfect, we have no basis for certainty that it's going to work to address these unique challenges that China faces. But within the fund, within the OECD community, within you know, economists who, know, who talk about these things all the time, rarely is there complete agreement about what is the best policy priority to deal with a given challenge, take within China. There has uh, uh, Governor Zhou Xiaochuan at the People's Bank getting ready to someday retire, probably, maybe, maybe pretty soon. But throughout his tenure, he has had to struggle with an internal debate about the sequencing of policy reform. Even if you agree what the right policies are, that you have to reduce capital account barriers and you have to introduce competition in the domestic banking system, there's still a huge question of which to do first. And if you can't, if the only way to get competition at home is by introducing foreign competition, is that okay before you've made your domestic institution stronger? You get the idea, yeah? Um, so, you know, it's at the end of the day, even if we have confidence, and not everyone in the West does, that Beijing intends the right policies and changes, still, we have to look at the outcomes now. We don't have the luxury to think we know what the right policy mix is and what its effects are going to be. Now our policymakers are already starting to do sometimes crazy things to change our China policies and our economic policies, thinking that they understand what's happening in China. So we don't have the luxury now of guessing what this policy change is going to mean a year from now, two years from now. We need to go ahead and look at the outcomes taking place in performance and use that as our test. 
We stop there. Um, Aaron um, raised the whole issue of the 19th Party Congress and what we can expect after that. I know there's some observers who are optimistic and they think that following the Party Congress, once President Xi has consolidated his power, that he may be in a much better position to pursue reform. Others um, have been more skeptical. Um, where do you and the IMF come out? Well, um, let me just preface this by saying, of course, the fund has no mandate or expertise to speculate about polis politics and, um, I kind of thought you'd say that. and what will happen. But <laughs> that being said, um, I think we all are looking forward to next week. We may get some clues in the appointments that are being made. I think people matter. And if uh, certain people that we all know um, are elevated or are out, I think that may mean something. First point. Second, uh, whether then the policy will really change or not, I think we will see in the December work conference. The first concrete results will come out about you know, December. The policies for the next year will be set down. So we will see the emphasis, even though those things are only published in March, we will be there in January and discuss it with them. So we will see that. For example, whether the growth target for next year will be softened or dropped or um, you know, be more realistic. Then comes the March Congress, which will set down the three-year program and, uh, and the third plenum in the fall. So we see new programs coming out. Judging from what the president um, and the current government's uh, the revealed pre preference for stability, uh, I think a reasonable baseline expectation is that things won't change dramatically. And I, my sense is, and then I can come back a, a bit to... Um, what are the authorities telling us in response to all this stuff that we are constantly telling us? You know, we have this dialogue with them where we meet at the very senior level. You know, Lagarde and David Lipton go there twice or three times a, a year and talk to the president and to the premier and to the Politburo. What are they telling us to what we are? They are quite uh, congruent with our analysis of the problems. I think there's no real difference in assessment of what the real issues are in the savings, investment, uh, debt, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's also no difference, basically, a view of the direction of policies and even the final outcome with some footnotes, market orientation, uh, all these reform directions are very congruent with what we're saying. I think the key difference is that they come back to us constantly with is A, we have a lot more time than you think. Our fiscal position is much stronger. So you cannot impose the Western metrics of an economy in terms of risk analysis and credit gaps and how fast you need to reform and the risks of a financial crisis, etc. Because our economy is so fundamentally different, our fiscal situation is much stronger. We own all the land in the country. We have a huge surplus in the balance sheet. So we can support our financial system for 10 more years if need be. So we have not one or two years, we have 10 years to finish this. Second, we have policies in place that actually have effects. Even if we don't see it everywhere, we have 35 or whatever provinces, every province has their SOE reform program. They are happening things on the ground that will gradually, slowly move this economy in the right direction. So I think it's more a matter of degree and speed. You know, fiscal deficit, they understand that local governments cannot continue to build up debt but they also know they cannot reform it overnight, and this has to be a gradual process. The one area where I think we have some sort of orthogonal views is this whole approach of the role of the state in creating champion industries and the uh, industrial sector and even the advanced service sector of the future in China. You've seen it in China Manufacturing 25, this whole approach of massive state support, both in terms of regulation and financial support, and putting the private sector and the state sector together. Now, there's two aspects to this. Whether this can actually be successful, I don't know, because again, China may be different, and they have shown in many areas that actually it can be successful, but it's not compatible with a level playing field and your concerns. You know, and as a fair player in the global system, that is very orthogonal to what I think is compatible uh, with how the world uh, wants to play. Um, well, thank you. Um, I think now we want to open the floor up. We have about 15 minutes left for this program. 
Um, I'd like to take a few questions and then um, turn to the panelists. So we have microphones. Um, the gentleman back there. Uh, thank you all very much. Lauren Hershey, I'm an attorney. Uh, I had been in the antitrust division of the Department of Justice, and I uh, am a longtime observer of China. It goes back 51 years, actually, as a student. Mm. And uh, Mr. Chu, I want to uh, single you out, if I may. Uh, my professor's last name was uh, anglicized. His last name was Chu also. <laughs> and he had a degree from uh, Columbia University, but he was a KMT, son of a KMT official. Samuel Chu, is, uh, as I recall. Uh, my question is a very short one, uh, which has to do with the process of the party Congress uh, having the opportunity to preview uh, what you are releasing on November 2nd. Very short question. Uh, through Mr. Chu or otherwise, are you going to make the slideshow available or the, this presentation available uh, before the party Congress begins on the 18th of this month? Other questions? I'm unaffiliated. My name is Kumar, and I had a simple question. Uh, President Xi Jinping has been cracking down on corruption, and I was wondering how big a factor is corruption in the Chinese economy? South China Morning Post, Zheng uh, Hualu. We heard Mark, uh, uh, Marcus comment on, on the policy change scenario after 19th Party Congress. Uh, uh, would other panelists' opinion on this? Uh, what's your forecast about the, the policy change uh, and uh, maybe priorities? And and uh, second question is about uh, about uh, President Trump's upcoming visit uh, to China. Uh, a lot of issues on the table. So so maybe uh, Minister Zhu or uh, or Erin can elaborate on. Uh, what could be on the top agenda of, uh, of, of uh, Mr. Trump and what could be our responses from from Chinese side. Thanks. OK, well, thank you. I think we have a, a good set of questions here. Perhaps we can start with the last question, because there is a lot of interest, um, not only in the party Congress, but what's going to come very quickly after that. And that's the president's trip to China um, and to Asia more broadly. Um, Minister Zhu, if I can ask you, um, what, what is China expecting when the president comes, comes to visit? I know these type of trips um, traditionally have been kind of action-forcing events. I know that there's a lot of travel and communication between our, our, um, our officials and our senior officials. And um, I would welcome your comments on um, how, how this visit could play out on the economic front. Uh, uh, I think... Uh, uh... Uh, both of our two countries are preparing uh, President Trump's uh, visit to China. Uh, uh, the two presidents had a, a very uh, good discussion uh, in Marago, uh, and after that, uh, the, uh, the two countries uh, have already done many things. Uh, we have already established a full framework uh, in the uh, eco comprehensive economic dialogue, uh, in diplomatic uh, relations, and uh, uh, cyber security issues, and the social and uh, cultural exchanges. Uh, all, all those four frameworks have finished their task. And uh, we also exchanged some uh, high-ranking uh, officials with it, uh, uh, like uh, Mr. Tillerson and uh, uh, State Councilor Yang Jiechi, and uh, we are also planning uh, to have some more uh, high-ranking officials visit to China, preparing uh, President Trump's visit. In economic uh, uh, field, uh, we are now uh, working. One issue is three open investigation. <laughs> As Aaron uh, yesterday, we we can have the uh, uh, three open investigation. Uh, uh, but uh, on this regard, we, we from a government uh, point of view, uh, we, we uh, express very clearly that uh, we are not officially participating in such a, 
uh, course because it is a unilateral one. It is according to American uh, domestic laws, and uh, we are more uh, focused on the uh, global, uh, 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 international, uh, uh, according to the WTO rules. Uh, but anyway, although we have some uh, 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 dif uh, different views, uh, we are preparing very positively for the uh, economic and trade uh, fruit for for the uh, uh, for. President Trump, uh, we are now working on uh, the uh, how to proceed the uh, one-year plan after so-called 100 days plan, and uh, uh, we try. Uh, the uh, President Trump is also going uh, along with him uh, a big business uh, uh, executive uh, team. Um, I think uh, many uh, uh, Chinese uh, company are also preparing to receive their corresponding uh, uh, executives uh, uh, with it. Uh, so uh, in every details, uh, we, we are going to uh, make uh, uh, President Trump's visit a very uh, successful for success. Aaron, can I turn to you on that issue? I mean, what would make a successful visit for your members? <laughs> um, oh, so many things. Um, I, I guess I would say a little bit of it probably does relate somewhat to the party Congress outcomes because I think some of what business is looking for is seeing some greater certainty about where China is going with its policies. And if the president's state visit can be used to provide that kind of clarity, um, it is traditionally been an action-forcing event. The um, U.S. government traditionally has a variety of things that it would like to see um, the government that it's visiting make some progress on. It wouldn't surprise me if some of those things involve technology transfer and intellectual property rights, even if it's not in the context of, of 301. Um, but I do think that that combination of um, seeing some good deals for American companies, that would get at much of what the administration has said it's interested in, in terms of seeing more balance in their relationship, um, as well as seeing some progress on policy issues. Uh, I think that would, be, that would constitute some success for this trip. Um, in terms of the other things that I think business would be interested in, certainly seeing China move forward on some of the additional market access liberalizations that have been talked about would be viewed very positively. Um, several weeks ago, as I recall, um, the financial ministries announced an interest in uh, considering liberalization in the various financial services sectors. And seeing China make progress in those areas, implement some of those um, openings for foreign companies um, on its own, I think would be a very positive outcome. Can I just raise one other issue? That's the issue of overcapacity. Um, I think that issue um, was, you know, presented a real challenge at the last meeting of the Comprehensive Economic Dialogue. Do you think we can see, we'll be seeing progress on that front? Uh, I think uh, uh, China uh, took a very uh, uh, serious uh, attitude towards overcapacity. I think uh, Chinese government has already uh, made a general uh, arrangement for, for uh, coping with uh, over, overcapacity. We are going to uh, reduce uh, the uh, 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 the steel capacity uh, uh, by uh, 65 million tons uh, uh, in the next uh, uh, couple of years, and also uh, we have we are going to uh, reduce tremendously for reduce those uh, coal uh, coal capacities. Uh, so we uh, we are in the meantime we also uh, took a very uh, positive attitude to join the uh, international discussion. We are going to uh, join the uh, uh, International uh, Steel uh, Forum uh, very uh, positively uh, and uh, uh, to co uh, cooperate with uh, uh, the rest of the world to, uh, to solve this issue. We, 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 we would like to say that uh, the overcapacity issue is not a single country issue. So it's a national issue. So it, it requires some uh, international cooperation. Wendy, can I just mop up yeah. a few of those other, real quick, those, some of those other questions? Um, we're going to be making the full output here available November 2nd. Right afterwards is the date to look for there. 
That's the bad news, not right before the party Congress, but right afterwards. The good news is one of the 10 uh, included uh, gauges is going to be competition policy, where we'll provide a measure of whether there's convergence in your odds of getting a merger review at their equivalent of our ATD, antitrust division, if you're a foreign firm or a Chinese firm, right? And whether those are starting to come together, because there's been a pretty big gap. You've got about a 20% chance if you're foreign, about a 3% chance if you're Chinese, right? Of getting reviewed. Of getting reviewed in, mm-hmm. in for you know, a, a normal merger transaction. Um, corruption, we don't really deal with in this uh, study. It's impossible to track into economic outcomes. But it's a good question because it's a critical issue for implementing good reform across the board. I understand very well why President Xi put so much emphasis on this during his first term. Finally, in terms of policy change after the Congress, I, I should be, we, we just recently looked back at the odd year Congresses, the midterm Congresses in 87, 97, 2007, that are equivalent to this in some way. 87 to 97 had big bangs of change came out of them. Deng Xiaoping in, in 87. In 97, uh, the state owned enterprise reform initiatives were introduced. 2007, not so much. The global financial crisis was underway. Nobody was in the mood to talk about more big bangs at that point. Um, We'll see. But regardless of whether there is, I hope there is, rhetorically coming out of this Congress, Mm -hmm. these measures we're looking at here are structural long-term trends. You can't turn around labor wage growth in in a quarter or two. You can't change the environmental impacts in a quarter or two. The most, I think, valuable contribution of this is not to use it each quarter to make a quick judgment, but rather as a basis, a framework for conversation between Chinese officials, American officials, European and other interested parties to get back to looking at fundamental measures of economic improvement rather than just talking about our fears of one another. Uh, Wendy, may I add one more word? Uh, uh, China is the only one country in the world to to uh, to have its uh, specific uh, uh, target to reduce the uh, capacity on steel and coal. So, uh, from 19 uh, uh, from 2016 to 2020, we are going to reduce the uh, uh, steel production from uh, uh, 100 million to 150 million metric tons. Uh, that is our plan, and uh, we are going to uh, to arrange those uh, uh, 500,000 uh, uh, laid-off workers, and we are going to bear some uh, tax uh, 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 loss for 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 12 billion uh, uh, RMB yuan uh, in 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 2016. Uh, only one year we have already reduce uh, uh, 60, uh, uh, 65 million uh, tons. And uh, in 2017, we are planned to reduce uh, another 50 million tons. Yeah, that is uh, the, 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 the correct words. So may I, I, I close the round number? OK, yeah. thank you. Marcus, any comments on any of the questions raised on corruption, overcapacity? Um, um, take your pick. Yeah. <laughs> Quickly on overcapacity and corruption. Overcapacity, no doubt about the intention and efforts. Again, we have to remind, remember that the central government, the center top in China is not all powerful. Often these guidelines trickle down and then what really happens is decided at lower levels. And it's very hard for us to monitor, but you know, uh, we can see that in steel, for example, there's a real effort of shutting down unproductive, loss-making, subsidies absorbing lines. And this is difficult, but it's happening. At the same time, we see new production lines that are very efficient, probably world-class steel lines coming online. And we have actually seen total steel production rise in 16 and 17. Now, what the central government can do here, you know, the question then is, are these new lines really market-oriented or are they also huge subsidies? So I think it's a complex issue that is not just um, cannot be answered easily. And I, th- I don't think uh, there's uh, the, 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 the lack of intention, but it's uh, more complex in practice. On corruption, I think um, Dan alluded to this, that this is really uh, a key issue. 
when um, in the high days of uh, the early 2000s, you know, uh, it was quite well known that the, the, the two key drivers of growth clearly were the nominal GDP targets for, the, for each Communist Party official, the competition between them to get promoted, and frankly, private wealth creation, corruption in the context of these huge investment projects that were driving. And I think Xi Jinping, it's a very, very interesting rec recent book that was published that you know, one of the key lessons he seems to have drawn from the fall of the Soviet Union was that the Communist Party in, 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 in Russia just was becoming totally corrupt and was hollowed out. So this cancer in the, in the system, both because it created inefficient, unsustainable growth, but also politically, it was like the pollution of the system. One can almost compare it. And therefore, this huge drive of rooting out co uh, corruption in the economic system and in the political system, I think is, is key for the economy as well as for the... Um, of course, eventually the legitimacy for the CCP. And it's actually one of the most popular things in China, together with the anti-pollution efforts. So I think it, it is a key, important, and overall, I think, positive uh, development, uh, whether it's going to be successful in the, with the systems they have, lack of independent judiciary, and so on. We all know what the issues are. But the reason for attacking it and the fact that it's being driven uh, from the top down is, 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 is quite um, impressive. On that note, um, please join me in thanking the panel for um, the excellent discussion. And um, we look forward to our um, public release of the dashboard. And we hope that it's a tool that you all find useful as you um, continue to um, monitor Chinese progress on this important reform front. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you.